This is the Misdirected Mark Podcast, a podcast about gaming, game mastering, and entertaining you, our listeners. We are explicit, and you have been warned, and I'd like to thank Mike Willard for letting us use his music on our show. Now let's pick up those mics and get on with this thing. All right, folks, we're going to get this campaign off the ground tonight. Uh, this is our session zero, uh, so we're going to be playing a new DCC campaign. Sound good, guys? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. All right, awesome. Cool, let's get started. I want to play a dwarf and cleric. Uh, nope, that's not part of the game. Uh, there's no dwarves uh-huh. and clerics. Pick something else. I want to start with the laser pistol. I saw rules for one of the zine. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. We're sticking to the core book and the annual. That's it. Uh, magical mustaches. Yes! Magical mustaches is are, are, are in the annual. Can my patron be Mark Zuckerberg? What? What? Oh, come on. Think super evil, patron of lies and deception. Mm, okay, I'm going to allow that, but um, we're going to reskin that to something more fantasy. All right, is that it, guys? That should do. That should all do. All right, cool. Then uh, with all that set, we've got ourselves a campaign. Let's go do this. Yes, let's do this. Welcome to the 390th episode of the Misdirected Mark podcast. Tonight, we're going to talk about setting boundaries in your games, and then we're going to sit and chat in the conversation corner. But first... I'm Old Man Logan. I'm Phil. And I'm Jerry. And we're yeah. here. And I'm not getting anything through here. Welcome, welcome. All right, everybody in the chat room, please do let us it's know better. if we're having any issues with audio. I'm still getting used to this, but I think I've got it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you are uh, You are advancing greatly. You're like second level audio engineer. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Okay, I'll take second level. Second level audio engineer. I think next, next, uh, next level you specialize. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Um, which call it. That's awesome. <laughs> and you get new feet. What's that? And he gets a new feet. Yeah, he, and you get a feet. That's awesome. Yeah. And now for an amazing feat. Um, oh, Bob's a little quiet. They're I'm saying. Quiet? They're saying you're a little quiet. Wow. I don't know how much more I should pin myself before this gets crazy, or wild, or wacky. Cool. We're gonna start with. Um, we're gonna start with one thing. Um, Jerry, tell me about one thing going on. Well, this uh, week. You. Spending a lot of time cleaning up the game room. Um, I'm clearing out a lot of uh, games and stuff to make more space down here and just kind of getting organized, which feels really, really good. If, um, plus catching up on the missed TV shows. If we could pan the camera, which we're not going to because no. we don't mess with the camera, but if we could pan the camera, you would you would understand what Jerry means. Like, this this place is basically a large game store in, in a basement. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in here. There's 11 shelves of role-playing games and 9 shelves of board games. Yeah, it's some so. impressive stuff. Yeah, this is the, a, loaded, uh, a loaded basement for sure. Uh, Bob, how about you? What's your one thing? Uh, so I have been fighting a sinus infection. Well, that's not a, yeah, it's not that's a, a fun, fun one thing. It's not a fun one thing, but the fun part is that I'm finally on the mend. Good. I went into my doctor's office yesterday, got a, a, a script for uh, antibiotics, took the first dose, which is the double dose yesterday, Second dose today. I woke up this morning way better than I've been waking up for the last week. Oh, that's good. So it's been uh, it's been an ugly ten days, eleven days now. Um, oh, sorry, because we weren't on last week because you were yeah. sick. Yeah, uh-huh. that's right. So um, I'm back. I'm better than ever, and uh, now I should make some kind of announcement about not making weapons or something like that. I think. Uh, no, I'm not. not making... I'm thinking Iron Man again. Oh, yes. okay, got it. That's funny. Uh, let's see. My one thing. Um, my one thing is uh, Narcos Mexico. Um, I've been watching uh, season two, and uh, I'm uh, I'm um, trying to get it finished because I started playing more Minecraft, and um, those two things never mix. Like once I start playing Minecraft, I stop watching TV. Yeah. So I need to. Um, I, I'm buckling down. I've been watching it. Um, I've been watching it at work. Um, which is mostly safe, but the thing with Narcos is most of the shows in Spanish, and I don't speak Spanish, so um, it's not something I can put on. Like it's not something I can put on and do something else. Like you kind of have to pay attention. You gotta watch, yeah. right? Like there's a lot of um, there's a lot of subtitles, which I love, but it's just it's it's a show where it's like, well, I'm gonna watch Narcos, and I'm gonna sit down and watch it. And then yeah. I was telling you guys over dinner, uh, I'm watching the show, and the uh, main character uh, for the two seasons of Narcos Mexico, uh, Felix, who's the, the main the head cartel guy. I'm like watching it and I'm like, one, this is a very attractive man. Two, like I really like this actor. I'm like, why, like I really like this actor, who is it? And I Googled it and it's the guy who plays Cassian from Rogue One. And I'm like, oh, of course I like this guy. Like, <laughs> oh, that guy. Well, I loved him in Rogue One. Mm-hmm. So 
Um, and I forget, you you said his name before. Uh, Diego, Diego Luna. Luna. Yes. He's excellent, by the way. He's excellent in Narcos Mexico. Um, and they've been actually doing a really good job because um, that's technically that would be seasons four and five of Narcos. And they've done a couple, and, but they take place back in time where uh, they take place interwe interwoven with seasons one, two, and three from the Colombian ones. Mm -hmm. But they've pulled characters from all of the past episodes as they cross through this guy's um, story. And they like went and found everybody. And it's great. Like every now and then, like somebody turns, like somebody turns around. And I'm like, oh, that's the guy from you know, from the Cali cartel or whatever. So anyway, totally digging Narcos. Um, uh, totally digging Narcos Mexico. I loved the first three seasons. I loved uh, the first season of Mexico, and this uh, second season um, is also uh, really good. It is a perfect example of how um, Hillfolk, the drama system, mm. should play. Like, yeah. this game is so much of uh, petition and granting. Like, so much of, like, trying to get what you want and then, like, not getting what you want and that kind of thing. It's really, like, a, it, it's really a good showcase of um, that petitioner and granter kind of thing. Anyway, um, that is my one thing. Mm -hmm. We got a couple of announcements, right? Yep, uh, at least one. At least one. Um, it's all over now. The trophy... Um, the trophy... Um, Kickstarter finished, uh, but it made enough money that I'm writing one of the stretch goals. Yay! Yeah, so I'll be writing uh, something for uh, Trophy Gold. Yeah, actually, I was very flattered. Uh, Jace Cordova um, uh, asked me if I would like to uh, be part of the project, and I think Trophy's uh, really slick, and um, I was super excited uh, to get to do it. So, yeah. Tell, um, us, tell us in 50 words or less what it's about. Uh, Trophy. So, Trophy is a game... Um, it is a it is a game. It's a uh, group of people. So there are different settings, right? So there's it's a group of people going on a basically ill-fated adventure, looking for some sort of treasure, mystery, or something. Like yeah. it depends on there's um, there's trophy gold, which is more uh, fantasy, and then there's uh, trophy dark, which is more horror. Mm -hmm. So I will be um, I will be writing for trophy gold uh, when for uh, old Kaldor the um, uh, the mega dungeon. Cool. So that, that's very cool. Very cool. Uh, I also want to give a shout out. Um, uh, Passions de Passiones um, Kickstarter launched today, and uh, we we're all fans of that um, of that game. I mean, already backed. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it is a game of of telenovela. Um, I played it at GatorCon. It was um, ridiculously fun, um, and that was just the ash can. Like this is now like the um, the full game. So cool, uh, and I believe it's already funded. I believe it's doing great. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that that one had enough fans already that it was going to back it. Oh, yeah. It. Plus, the premise is just fantastic. <clears throat> I mean, who doesn't want to play outrageous, you know, outrageous soap opera? Maria. Style? Yeah. Por qué? <laughs> uh, my Spanish is terrible. I'm sticking to just circular yes. English. Um, but yes, so good. All right, anyway. Wait, wait Phil? Yes. Are you Sancho? Yeah, no. I actually, when we played the, at GatorCon, I was I was um, I was the wife, um, which was great. Like, I was the like I was the um, cold, calculating wife that would do anything to keep her husband in power, um, including shooting that shooting that lawyer in the face. No, I don't know. I think I shot him in the chest. I don't think I shot him in the face. He was a lawyer, so you know he deserved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, he was gonna. Conf he was gonna. He was about to spill the beans on like my husband's illegal activities. Can't have that. <clears throat> can't have that. No. I didn't want him to do it. I did it for him out of love. Anyway, um, yeah, that's pretty much all of our announcements right now. All right. So uh, I believe tonight we've got a workshop. <laughs> Ready? Yep. No, wait, wait, wait. Um, 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 okay, I'm warmed up. All right. Yeah. Workshop! Workshop! Set the boundaries! Keeping the game inside the boundaries! Don't go outside of them, you're gonna ruin the game! Keep it in! Define your boundaries! Hold everybody in the boundaries! Workshop! Don't suck! All right. Mm. <laughs> Take a sip of coffee for a moment. <laughs> that never gets old. <laughs> ah, thank you. You know, no, there's no rehearsing that, right? No. Like, I literally, I don't know what I'm going to say. That is off the starts. cuff every yeah. time. Yep. That is completely off the cuff. That is bespoke. <laughs> like our ad campaigns, bespoke. 
Uh, so I had this like weird dream, uh, technically two weeks ago, because we didn't do this episode last week. It's a weird dream um, where I was arguing with someone from our past gaming group who was trying to use like lines and veils to take things out of the campaign. And I was like, no, that's not how lines and veils work, right? And I was like trying to explain to this person, like there are other ways to like limit parts of a campaign, like setting boundaries and all that. And then I was like, wait, this sounds like a show topic. <laughs> so um, it got me thinking that yes, lines and veils is one type of boundary, but there's actually like a whole bunch of different boundaries that like you, you set up when you're setting, like when you're putting together a game. And I thought it would be kind of cool to, um, to do like an overview of all the different ways like you kind of set your boundaries. Does that sound good? Cool. I like it. All right. Let's do that. Cool. So, real quick. Hi, Schmitty. Hope you have a good drive home. Hey, Schmitty. Yay. So, uh, Phil, you want to set some of our uh, terms for tonight for no, the definitions? I, no idea. Oh, that means it's time for this. Behold, you are in the presence of Definition Panda. Yep, yep, That's indeed. Epic. Yeah, I love that power. Thank you, Todd Crapper. Um, so, we're talking about boundaries tonight, right? Um, a limit of a subject or sphere of activity, right? I like that. Um, I like that definition. By the way, I'm petting the cat, like who's hanging out with me. Anyway, um, and that's what we're talking about tonight, right? We're talking about limits. Now, RPGs, by their nature, um, have the potential for being limitless, right? Like, you can play it anywhere, anytime. Like, you know, you can be anyone, take any action, that kind of thing, right? Like, like in theory, not really in practice, but in theory, like anything can happen. Um, like, for instance, narratively, uh, the GM or anyone with narrative control could just potentially bring anything into the game by saying it, right? Like a GM, I mean, that's literally what a GM does is just kind of, you know, start saying stuff and it becomes part of the game. And again, if, if narrative controls pass to somebody else, that person, that other, you know, like that person who has it can do the mm -hmm. same thing. Um, and then mechanically, like rules and mechanisms um, can be added to a game, right? So there are supplements and house rules and all that stuff. Like those can get added to a game as well. Like, for instance, uh, original D&D, right? Uh, AD&D didn't have laser guns, but, you know, um, Expedition to the Barrier Peak sure did. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, that you can just add them into the game. Surprise. Yep. Yeah. All right. So um, there's a lot of different things that have different boundaries. So uh, let's talk about a couple important ones. Phil. Yeah. So uh, first one is tone, right? A game has a specific tone um, under which it was designed, right? Not generic games, right? Well, even generic games have a tone. Like, Savage Worlds has a tone. You can put any setting you want with it. It still feels like Savage Worlds, right? Mm -hmm. Fast, furious, fun. Um, but my point is that many games through their settings also have tones. Um, while both Call of Cthulhu and Paranoia are terrifying at times, those are two very different tones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also setting content. A game setting often helps to define the content that, that it's in. Um, for example, if you take Dragonlance game and suddenly add surface-to-air missiles, it's a very, very different game than the original books or modules. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> uh, surface-to-air gully gnomes, missile kender. I, I would play that. I mean, I think the gnomes. I, I think the gnomes are the ones who build them, right? Like surface-to-air missiles. Maybe surface-to-air kender. Right, <laughs> surface-to-air kender. <laughs> I'm it's not good. against this. Yeah. Um, another thing is safety, right? Uh, safety is. Um, so there exists, um, uh, what you call it? There exists in any player, right, material that we don't want to encounter in a game, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, and I, I often reference this, uh, but Bob doesn't like spiders, right? It's oh. not, a, it's not a thing. Know. Yeah, it's not a thing Bob likes to come up in games, um, and um, you know, sometimes that stuff's outside of a setting, um, but other times, like, it's entirely possible. Like, if we were gonna play like Q1, Queen of the Demon Web Pits, like, we gotta have a talk first. Right, because I can, yeah, I can do it. Right, you, but it would be worth having a talk. Yeah. Right, are are you going to be uh -huh. okay with it? Um, how, how do you feel about scorpions? Scorpions are fine. No, Bob just doesn't like spiders. Eberron, baby. Honestly, <laughs> when it comes to games, more often than not, it doesn't really bother. Me. Yeah, but if we did like a, if we did a serious horror game we did and a it was spider theme, spiders, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's what I'm saying. Like if we did like if we did if if we did a um, uh, what you call it? Um, sorry, I just I just flaked. Oh, um, cool. I mean, Call of Cthulhu would certainly be one of them. Um, trophy Dark, like if we did a Trophy Dark and it was like all about 
spiders and, you know, that kind of stuff. Like, you, you could potentially have a problem with that, right? It would, so, it would be a rough game. Yeah, so safety is definitely a thing. Now, I, 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 I named you for uh, spiders, but for me, it's roaches. Like, roaches skeeve me the hell out. Like, I do not like roaches in real life, in movies, like nothing. Like, I saw a creep show as a kid. I was not okay at the end of that movie. I don't know if you remember it, but yeah, I was- I remember that very I well. was not okay. I, I don't think I've got any of those. No? Mm. My, I definitely do mine not. Mine are all mental emotional, so those are, <laughs> yeah. those are different lengths and veils. Uh, what, uh, what, what other boundaries we got? Well, we've got rules. Um, mm -hmm. A game can also often have rules that are outside its core rules, supplements, player option books, companions, modules, <coughs> Pathfinder. Um, <coughs> excuse me. All D20. Yep. Uh, and these can be from core designers. They can be from third party uh, parties. And you also have to have the boundaries that are set by the party itself. The people playing the game, the GM and the players may set their own boundaries, their own house rules, their own settings. Um, and all of those are things that need to be discussed and set in place ahead of time so you don't surprise somebody with them later on. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, you've played a lot of Savage Worlds. Savage Worlds has, like, a lot of people have house rules for Savage uh -huh. Worlds, warm up decks, and things uh -huh. like that. Yeah. Yep. So, there's a reason why um, the reason why boundaries are important, right? I, I mentioned at the part when we, in the beginning when we were doing definitions that um, that RPGs can technically be limitless, right? Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, they don't actually work when they're limitless. Um, the wow. games work best when everybody's working inside an established narrative space, um, and when the things that people are saying and the actions they're taking are kind of consistent with everyone else's expectations for the game, right? Like that's where a game like really works is mm -hmm. like when like if you know I I ran years ago many many years ago I ran uh, Amber Diceless, mm -hmm. and one day I like ad libbed a shadow walk with um, with um, my buddy Craig, um, you know from the Slack room. And it was like a really weird adventure because he just kept like taking it like through shadow to like one weird place after another. And I was like, I mean, technically it was in the boundaries of the game, but it was like really hard, like to, to kind of, um, to kind of deal with, mm -hmm. um, just because like he kept changing things and making it weird, but it, it, we're, you know, like oddly enough, that's a thing you can actually do in that game. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, the reason boundaries are important is because truthfully, um, we actually operate better when a game is inside a certain set of boundaries. And when it's not within a set of boundaries, then somebody steps out of the expected space in the game, and it's going to really upset the flow of the game and the feel of the game. Mm -hmm. um, it can be jarring to the point that it just interrupts the flow entirely, and everybody gets stepped out of it, and the shared narrative is disrupted. People no longer feel part of the game itself. Um, think about like when you have an off note in the middle of the song, or when you hear a song that, that's not being played properly, you suddenly know it's there and you notice it immediately and you're no longer listening to the song itself. Like Guitar Hero. Like when you play the wrong note in Guitar Hero, like you immediately know. Or when they play a rock song really, really slow. Oh, don't, be, <laughs> don't be doing that. There's nothing wrong with that for <laughs> Just sure. kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but these can all grind the game to a complete halt. And um, this ends up causing discussions, disagreements, arguments over what should be done. and. It's fun to sometimes play with the edges of setting boundaries, but just need to have them in place and have consensus. Because if one person's trying to push the boundaries or change the boundaries, um, it's going to be really jarring to the GM and the other players. Yeah, you ever play in a game where, like, you ever play in a game where, like, one player is, like, completely, like, their character concept is completely off from everyone else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you're, you're just, like, literally, like, trying, like, as a player, like, how are we all going to, like, how, how are we moving through the story? Uh, fantasy trip. We had a player who came in. He insisted that he be allowed to play a um, Roman legionnaire that had fallen through a hole into this planet, and just the GM let him. And it was just very just just jarring because he kept trying to refer back to uh, you know Earth topics and Earth subjects and Earth places, and also trying to leverage it into bonuses and knowledge and so on as and it is excused to be extremely racist but that's another part of it oh, yeah but it was just it was it, just when he started it but was i'm just jarring. playing my character yeah. you know <laughs> i uh, hate when they try to leverage every opportunity in a bonus like can i get you know can i get a plus two on that can i get a, can I get a plus on this because it's you know for my fire thing because <laughs> you know this is really a 
like I'm really hot about this topic, so yeah. that's for Moira, right? <laughs> I, uh, my first time playing Swords Without Master, uh, Rob, Rob Dybald was, um, uh, was the overplayer, and it was uh, Rach, myself, <clears throat> and this third person who sits down at the table. Mm -hmm. And I forget what Rach's character was, but it was pretty badass. And it inspired me, because when I did mine, I was the last dwarf, mm -hmm. right? Like, that was yeah. my actual, like, one of my five things was, like, I am the last dwarf. Right, and then the next guy goes, and he's like, "I'm Tim the Wizard," you know, like from you know, and I'm like, "What?" But like, no one reined him in, yep. so we had like, we had like two like, um, dark badass characters and Tim the Wizard coming along with us, and I was like, "Oh man!" Like mentally, I would have been spent oh, the, rest of the game poking him in the eyes. Just like, Stop I, it. Stop oh, it was Stop so. It. Oh, it was like it was just so jarring. Like, like, cl like clearly Rob had like shown us the eidolon, right? Like, there was this like perfect boundary, and this guy like just was like, boink, I'm on the outside of it, and it's like, oh. so, something that really annoys me as a player, as a GM, I just don't allow it. But as a player, is I feel it's insulting to the GM when you sit down to play a game and the GM gives you this broad area to play in. And player decides, I'm just going to pick something from outside of here. Uh -huh. And as a player, I, I, I'm like, just go and leave. If you don't want to play in this, just go. The GM's giving you all this to work with. It's insulting to not at least try to play in their playground a little bit. It's your playground too, but don't go out of your way like that. Uh, I, I mean, I agree, yeah. right? Like, and if you're playing a narrow game, right? Like, yeah. there's a reason, like, you might be playing a narrow game. Mm -hmm. Like, then it's even more important. Like, like if we're playing... Um, like, like, for instance, if we're playing, like, The Hood, mm -hmm. where we're low-level street criminals, yeah. right? Like, you can't be, like, you can't make your character to be like, I'm a big, big mobster. I'm like, no, you're not. Like, yeah. <laughs> like my, my, my common example for this is what I say, one of the reasons I don't run certain games, I sat down with one of my groups and said, okay, we're going to play Masks. You're all high school students, and you're all teenagers. And immediately two of the players are like, I'm 19. I'm like, no, no, that's, you're right. not, we're not going to play masks then because you guys obviously don't want to play within yeah. the obvious sandbox. We're yeah. just not going to play. And Which was probably actually a great call. Oh, it was. Yeah. It was. Um, I know Ange had this problem a couple years ago at a table. Um, she was running um, Tales from the Loop mm -hmm. and, you know, full kids on bike. And like this person was like, I don't ride a bike or something. Yeah. I don't yeah. <laughs> like, like, like. <laughs> <laughs> like you're just like you're killing it here. Like we're all trying to do a thing, right? Like, and, and I think I like to say that this is something I see as a player. You're allowed to turn to the GM and other players and say support the GM a little bit and say, you know what, that doesn't seem like it fits with this. Yeah. With this milieu. Yeah. Too, too often the players at the table leave it entirely to the GM to make those decisions. Right. And the GM doesn't know what to say if nobody else says no. And sometimes the GM, like I've been this GM, right? Like I've yeah. said, I've said yes to things where I should definitely not have said mm -hmm. yes because I wanted, like, to keep the players happy. I've... And if a couple of the other players may have spoken up and said, you know, I don't think that really right, fits, you might have been like, yeah, let's. I know. Like sometimes you feel like you're out there, like yeah. against the players, and you're like, yeah. no, it's you fine. You can play this character. And... Yeah. So support your GM. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. We're... Slight divergent there. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> no, it's good. All right, so, um, right, so from the player's perspective, right, knowing boundaries actually does make it easier on players mm -hmm. because it limits choices. It's like what we've been saying, right? It, yeah. it helps you hone, it helps you hone those choices, um, which is good because sometimes as a player, um, if a game is super expansive, like, you can kind of get that like analysis paralysis. Like I'm so used to playing Powered by the Apocalypse games that like I I rarely freeze up making a character because it's really like check a box, check a box, circle a thing. Oh, that's a cool concept. I'm I'm off and running. Yeah, you've got but, a nice nice <laughs> nice uh, list of constraints that you can that guide you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of having a completely blank slate, it's just like working on you know here write an essay on whatever topic you want in the next half an hour. Blank piece of paper, go. Yeah. Like, well, uh, what am I gonna write? <laughs> right. Exactly. Like, like literally. Like, okay. Well, here's two books worth of character classes. Yeah. Like, you know, pick something, and it's like, uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, play the gunslinger, right? And yeah. like, you know, like, and now it's weird, right? You know, unless the you know, and then the GM's like, oh, I, I meant two books of that, but not the gunslinger, right? Like, it's, yeah. So yeah. So again, having boundaries. Helps make decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's also helping games where you have um, triggering material coming up. 
things where that might be difficult or dangerous to talk about, um, that when you use those along with safety tools, you can give players room to role play really sensitive topics and play characters with various character traits and situations that might not be used in traditional games um, while still keeping within the boundaries of safety and consent. And if you're playing a game that might be a little, I hate to use the word edgier because edge has become bad, but an edgier sort of game, <clears throat> if you put boundaries down, you know, okay, we're going to allow these kind of characters. We're going to talk about, you know, all of your characters have suffered abuse, so we're going to deal with that as post-traumatic stress disorder, and it's part of the game. The players know what they can do and where they should go and when they're stepping over a line, and it makes it a lot easier to play as a character. Yeah. And open up. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Um uh, what you call it? So, um, this this all like all of this discussion goes back to why boundaries are important, right? So, boundaries create limits, which in turn sets expectations. And really, if I could sum up like ninety percent of all GMing advice, it like falls into two categories, right? Like better communication and setting expectations, right? Mm -hmm. So, this is a thing that sets expectations for everyone who's going to play. Yep. Um, and when we all know the limits, and when we choose to play nicely in them. Right, we um, the chance that we're going to hit the off notes is actually far less. Right, the game winds up being more harmonious because uh, we're all now playing um, in this space. I got a lot yep. of hand gestures for this, right? Like a like a conclusive hand gesture, yeah. circles and things you, like you that. You think you might be partially Italian? Oh, I am half Italian. <laughs> if I sat on my hands right now, I would stutter. <laughs> like that's how it is. I know that's a stereotype, but it is so. It like it's completely true for me. Yeah. I'm half Sicilian, so I know the same thing. I was born at St. Joseph's Day, so I kind of inherited. I, I don't know. I, <laughs> yeah. you know. I think you're reaching, but that's yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, cool. So let's let let's talk a little bit about um, maintaining, creating, like creating, maintaining, and reviewing boundaries. Well, now we know what they are and why they're needed. Let's talk about how to establish them, how to maintain them, and how to review them. Yeah, Bob or uh, Phil. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll do the first one, and then I'll kick it to you. Right. So establishing boundaries. Right. Um, the first place we es we establish boundaries is in our session zero. So if we're running a campaign, our session zero is our first place where we're going to set our boundaries. Um, and your session zero should have a, um, a a large focus on you know getting those boundaries set up properly. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of ways this can be done, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the cat's technique from um, from the gauntlet, right? The cat's technique uh, will help you with. Um, with your tone, your content, and all of that, right? That'll help people understand, like, this is what this game's about, these are the actions we take, that, that kind of thing. Or uh, define what the CATS technique is real quick. Oh, I always forget this acronym. Uh, Rob's going to find it in a few seconds okay. and post it. Great, um, thanks, Rob. But it's content, um, shit. Um, tone is T. Um, That's got to be setting. Uh, I think so. I'm so, I use it but I always refer to it when I use it. And I always set it up in my session zero. Content, aim, tone, subject matter. Thank you. Content, what's in this game? Aim, what is our purpose for playing it? Tone, what is the general tone of this game? And subject matter, what kinds of things do you expect to be in the game? Yeah. That's all I needed. I just needed the acronym. <laughs> I had it. You put it in the notes. It was all in there. <laughs> there we go. Um, but I love that technique. Um, you can do it in like four, like I, I make a little table Mm -hmm. Like content, aim, tone, subject matter, and just write it's them in. It's a super useful shortcut. It is a super yep. useful shortcut. In fact, I'll be doing it this week to get ready for our Headspace yep. game. Uh, next one that helps uh, at session zero is Lines and Veils. Mm -hmm. Lines and Veils is the safety boundary creation tool. It is not the only one, uh, but it is my favorite one. Mm -hmm. um, and if you just heard Pandas, I think, um, that came out this week, yep. Senda and I have a long talk about... Um, our evolving thoughts on lines and veils, um, both of us, which is that we both still love lines and veils, but actually starting to see it as more than just a session zero tool. Mm -hmm. But having a lines and veils discussion, um, and I have a couple that are almost, they're automatically things I put into every game, mm -hmm. um, and just collecting, you know, from everyone else a couple of the other ones um, are really good. Okay. Um, supplement list. If you are playing a game that has many, many much supplements, like back in the day when we played like, you know, D20 stuff. Um, coming up with a list as a GM of these are the only the supplements we're allowing in the game mm -hmm. is a huge boundary creation. Mm -hmm. um, especially when it was just the, you know, the old days of, hey, I found this thing on drive through RPG, like, can I play it? <laughs> Little do you know, no one play tested that, right? Like it's, um, and now it's gonna blow up your game. Yeah. Um, so having that supplement list is really important. 
uh, because it will narrow uh, what's this game, like what's gonna be in this game. And if you're using house rules, having a review of your house rules. I haven't house, had to house rule in a long time, um, but when we used to play Corporation, um, Corporation was a game that was uh, had, um, it was a pretty loose rule set. So we had done a number of um, ru like rulings and kept them codified in a Google Doc. Mm -hmm. So anytime we played a new campaign of Corporation, because we did play a couple, uh, we would break out that Google Doc and just go back through it really quick and just be like, okay, does everybody remember um, these were our house rules? Like, mm -hmm. these are the rulings we came up for in these games, uh, you know, from multiple times playing this game. Is everybody still cool with all these? Yep. Mm -hmm. So, like, those helped a lot. So again, um, talking about what the game's gonna be about, talking about safety, what kind of rules are going to be in it? Like, uh -huh. those set up your initial boundaries. Okay, yeah. now well, we've survived session zero and are playing the game. Now what do we do? Now we have to maintain those rules. And during the game, you're going to normally have to enforce these boundaries. Um, there's a few ways this can be done. The first is from GM Fiat. Uh, the GM just has the power to say no. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, can use that to maintain boundaries. Uh, it's best to explain why, but you need to be able to say that once in a while. And they can also use the ability to create new boundaries, uh, either to uh, add to the spirit of the existing ones or to plug a leak that came up because of what's going on in the game. Mm -hmm. The second is going to be rulings and house rules. Uh, the GM can create house rules that are going to support the boundaries that have been created, uh, or they can use those to uh, reinforce and patch whatever leaks come up. Um, sometimes you just have to have a rule. Something came up that we saw that was overbalanced, something that wasn't playtested properly, or just a combination of things that suddenly came up, or a reaction to a house rule that already exists. Mm -hmm. We changed something, we forgot that it's going to affect this in a bad way. Yep, um, absolutely. And lastly, they're going to be all your safety tools. And these are things like the X car, the support flower, OK check-in, script change. And those are by no means the only safety tools that are out nope. there. But using any or all of those can help to maintain existing boundaries and uh, help create new ones as needed. Um, we've seen a lot of the script change uh, and the rewind. When something comes up, you say, wait, 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 that didn't work. We need to stop take that back to the beginning of this combat encounter and let's discuss what happened next. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's okay to do. So once you've done all that, now you need to review those house rules. Yeah, yeah. So here's the thing where, um, like I know myself, I fall down on this a lot, but um, if you are running a long, if you're in a long running game, so mm -hmm. your campaign has now gone on um, for a number of sessions, like for instance, we finished um, session 16 of um, Forbidden Lands on yeah. Sunday. We're 16 sessions into this game, yep. right? Um, how much of session zero do you remember? Because I know I don't. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, see? <laughs> so, so review is actually a thing that um, I think a lot of people do a really good job setting boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think I, like if you're doing a session zero, you're doing, you know, like you're doing that. And I think people do a pretty good job of enforcing boundaries, right? Because um, handling things as they come up in play and stuff like that is, um, is pretty common. But I know for me, like, I don't do a good job of going back and being like, what did we say in session zero? That's an excellent point, especially now that we brought in another player, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It we brought might, Jim it in. It might not be a bad idea to go look over your notes for session zero. And just see, and like. Maybe throw it up on, uh, on a Google Doc. For yeah. Us and say, hey, let's take a look at these. Yeah. And, and, and also that kind of goes with, and I used to do, I used to do this when we played Iron Heroes. We played, um. That Iron Heroes campaign, I think, what, was it two or three years? years? Mm -hmm. Three years. Every year, I would reread the rules and inevitably find out that for like the last year, we had played something completely yeah. wrong. Um, and I'm at the point right now with Forbidden Lands where I want to reread the rules because like, I'm like, oh, I think I know these rules now. And I'm like, mm, do mm. I? Like, check yourself. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a good point. Like, I like I have the session zero info from Forbidden Lands, but like, when was the last time any of us looked at it? Like, all we sit down and we play the game. So review is like a big thing, and you can use it in play too. We, yeah. we've got uh, with our Savage Worlds, we're doing Savage Eber Eberron, and so the bennies work very differently in that game. I actually have it on a little three by five card in bold letters that I stick into a little box at the corner of the table at the beginning of every session, explaining what to do. And we also have um, those dry erase playing cards. Mm -hmm. And if something comes up that's a setting rule or just for this session, we write down and put it in the middle of the table so people can Smart. all look at it and see it and remember what it is over and over and over again. Um, so it doesn't become a recurring problem. It's just 
different tools you can use to reinforce it to the players because you might remember them. Yep. They might not. So Ange just in the commented on a thing mm -hmm. I was just about to touch on. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons you review it is sometimes the things that you've set in session zero are no longer relevant. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it is okay to update and refresh your, like, like maybe the game went in a different direction and it went organically and everybody at the table was cool with it because that like you all had a discussion and you were cool with it, but now it doesn't look anything like your session zero. Yeah. It's actually like, it's okay to kind of go back through and refresh things. Or maybe you said like, we're not playing with any supplements and then like super awesome supplement 12 uh -huh. was released. And now you're like, uh, no supplements except for awesome yes. 12, yeah. um, that kind of thing. So yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. The purpose of reviewing um, is twofold, right? It's if you've drifted and you need to correct yourself, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Or you've drifted and you now need to reset the boundaries to where you are now yep. as opposed to where you were. Yep. And that's not going to be universal, right? You may have drifted um, and correct some things and you may drift and reset other things. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you may have set out on your uh, Scum and Villainy game, you're like, everybody at the table agrees. We don't want to be active participants trying to take down the, hege the hegemony. Yes. We just want to be exploring space and, and working some jobs, doing some bounty hunting, and that's it. And you get three, four, five sessions in, and all of a sudden an event happens, and everybody at the table is like, oh, it's time to take the hegemony down. <laughs> yeah. Now you've just completely gone against that boundary that you set, but everybody's yep. on board, yep. and it's time to let that train go. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I mean... You know, um, yeah, that's a, that's a perfect case of where the game has organically moved yep. into a space that you said you weren't going to, mm -hmm. but now you all want to. Oh, yeah. That's cool stuff. So, yeah, absolutely. Review yeah. is a thing, and I will be the first one to admit it. This is a case where I am not um, eating my own dog food, mm -hmm. right? Like, although... I, I haven't even thought of it myself as a player. Like, we, we haven't even thought about those those boundaries that we set for Forbidden Land. I know. <laughs> I'm, now, <laughs> I, I'm now, like, frantically racking my brain, like, was there anything in there? <laughs> like, I mean, so it actually is worth probably taking a yeah. look and seeing what's going on. Well, that's been our review of boundaries. Um, let's go check the chat room and see what they have to say about boundaries. Then we're going to come back and dive into our little roundtable discussion. But first, Bob... Tell me about another show on the Mr. Richard Mark Network. She's a super geek. She's a super geek is an any nominated actual play RPG podcast highlighting women as GMs. It's an amazing show. <coughs> Join them every other Tuesday for lots of different RPGs and guests. They do a fabulous job, and I highly recommend checking them out. We know that Jerry just touched his mic. Yes. <laughs> In the middle of send us promo. Oh, no. You're going to get dinged for that. Well, it was either that or cough <laughs> over the top of it, so. I don't know if there's a good. Uh... Yeah, how do, I, how do I get you to mute your, how do, you, how do I get you to mute me, Bob? What do um, I just point you? <laughs> we'll have to come up with some yeah. kind of a signal. Everybody's like, like you're. Like this or something. Like, yeah. Everybody's like, yeah, nice, crushing your head. <laughs> crushing your head. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, cool. Let's, let's check in the chat room. How's yeah. the chat room? So the chat room's like, they can't hear you. They, um, at all? No. Yeah. I don't know, but you, I keep seeing you on OBS, but I'm, I'm doing the thing there. I'm doing the mm -hmm. thing there and it's, I'm doing the thing over it's here. It's going to show up for everyone else. The chat room can't hear you, but I mean, I'm not doing a, a metric ton of talking, but I'll try pinging my, pinging myself over here. Yeah. Okay. See. So anyway, I did a terrible job of, um, of watching the, um, watching the chat room and Bob can't watch it while he's actually engineering the show. Yeah. So that hopefully is going to change because a little quick aside. Um, I've got a new laptop on the way because this uh, MacBook that I've been working on just has enough power to run the stream, and that's it. If I tried to switch over and actually run Twitch to, to look at the chat room, my machine would crash. So for now, uh, I can only do the stream here, and those guys are watching the chat room. But this week, a new laptop is arriving. I'm going to have it configured, hopefully ready to go for next Tuesday. So expect some bumps. But hopefully next Tuesday I'll be able to run the stream and pay attention to the chat room, and we'll be a little better. To translate, in case all of that was like Charlie Brown's teacher, mm. Bob's getting a new laptop that's uh, much speedier than the MacBook Air that he's trying to run off. this on, and uh, and uh, we'll be streaming like um, harder, faster, better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Apparently, if, if you're not getting your mic, you're getting mine. So uh, maybe during the rest of the show, if you speak, I'll just like I'll lean in and like. You can just get like you can just get close. All right. Anyway, 
Um, so back to the topic at hand, I'm looking to see if anyone had anything other than that we got a few demerits. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then like I said, Ange talked about the um, Ange talked about the uh, adjusting rule zero. Rob uh, did note it's concept, not content, but it's pretty much the same. Like, mm -hmm. what's the concept of this game? That kind of thing. Yep. Um, I actually really like cats. Like, um, I did. I think I did cats for both masks and for um, um, things from the flood, uh, and it was super helpful in like setting like because I think this is a thing that sometimes like before I did cats and thinking back like like almost a, almost 10 years now, one of the big problems I had in my past gaming group was tone. Like, mm -hmm. like I was like, like I was coming into games with this idea, like this is the tone of the game. And then like somebody in the group would not jive with that. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, you guys are killing me. Like, like this game isn't funny, right? Like yeah. this game's, dark and serious this or is not intended to be a lap riot. Right. right or the other way around like this game's hysterical why is it dark and serious right yep. and tone is one um it's it, like i don't really have a problem conveying like what rules are going to be in a game and i'm versed enough now to handle all my safety stuff um pretty adeptly right like i i will make sure all my safety stuff gets covered when i start up a game mm -hmm. um but tone is a place where in the past I dropped the ball so many times because some games you're playing Call of Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. Tone's pretty much understood. Mm -hmm. Worth bringing up to make sure everybody's on the same play page, yeah. but it's understood. But D&D &D doesn't actually have a tone. Right. Like you can play super dark serious D&D &D, mm -hmm. and you can play like lighthearted adventure romp D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. And if you don't set that boundary on tone, when you're setting up your game, like that's like where some of that weirdness comes in. Like, I'll give you a good example. Like we did a really good tone discussion uh, before we played Masks because we were playing, we were gonna play uh, The Spire. Yeah. Um, and we sat down to play and it was Glenn, Tony, Bob and I. And I was very upfront. I was like, look, this game is super dark, mm -hmm. right? Like it's dark, some of you are gonna die. Right, it's about uh, oppression and revolution. And like, this is our session zero. And Tony goes, I can't play this game. He's like, I, I don't want anything that heavy, that dark in my world right now. Mm -hmm. And I was like, cool, closed up the book, slid it over to the side. It was like, let's not play the Spire. Let's not force it. Let's not try to make it work. Yeah, let's cool. not test drive it and see if it's okay. Yeah. Like literally closed up the book and was like, cool, let's talk about, Let's talk about what kind of tone you do want to play. Yep. Yep. And ultimately that conversation led us to playing Masks. And that game um, was a huge hit for us oh, because it was right where we wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Now we did, um, again, this is a game group that kind of likes a, a um, not super heavy dark game, but we wanted to play things from the flood. And we had a cats discussion and everybody knew it was going to be heavy. And then we, which, and everybody was like, cool, yeah. it's heavy, it's dark, we're, we're, we're ready, we're ready, we want to play it because we really want to re, like, we want to play these characters again. And we started playing it, and Glenn was like, this game is super dark, I'm not sure how long I can play this. And Bob was like, yeah. <laughs> like, and it was totally cool, because one, at our session zero, we set the boundary, we definitely played in that space, but as soon as we started playing, it was a, table consensus thing like mm, this is like a little too dark to play long term mm -hmm. um but tone is a thing that i think i fail on um failed on i think i'm much better at it now i think yeah. i failed on it so much in the past and brings up the same kind of thing she said she's been in lots of campaigns where the gm would say we're gonna play this game make characters and the characters end up being all over the place because no one's narrowed down the genre or tone mm -hmm. Um, nobody gave the f characters a framework to work around, um, and it, it, it makes a difference. Um, even something as simple as, I'm going to fight fly the game right now, Savage Eberron. I told everybody starting out the game, I'm like, all right, you are all veterans of the last war. You've all lost a lot of things. We're going to actually play a session zero or session one where you guys are actually playing your last days of the war. Nice. And so everybody's, everybody's going to start the game with some combat skills. You're not going to be combat monsters, really, but 
you've all been warriors. So when you come with your character concept, I want you to tell me what you did in the war, why you know the rest of the players and why you were all a team, and what you've been doing for the last four years when the campaign starts, and why you're with everybody else. Make sure you have that cohesion, because I've, I've canceled campaigns because I sat there after the story arc was over and I said, you know what, there is no reason in hell that the six of you should be in the same party together. Yeah. And I think we're done with this campaign. Um, because nobody took the time to build that, that, that hook. And I love it when you have people that jump on that, but you have to set that to begin with as a GM. One of the things I loved, and then we'll wrap this up and head into our discussion part. One of the things I loved years ago when I was um, listening to Fear the Boot was Fear the Boot had this thing called the campaign framework. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of session zero, but it wasn't as in, it was it wasn't quite as encompassing as like what we now consider session zero. Mm -hmm. But it was a it was a there was a template document you could bring to the game. But the essence of it was justify why you're a party. Yep. <laughs> like like whatever whatever game you were playing, whatever concept you come up with, the one thing you have to do is fit in as a group. So figure it out. Like, like if, if you're if if I'm the cleric of good and Bob is like you know the assassin of Orcus, you better fit. You better sit down and figure out why you two haven't killed each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and then make it work. Like it was a it, it was a great boundary. Like it was because um, again, what it got rid of was it got rid of. Um, those ridiculous party conflict things. Mm -hmm. I say ridiculous. I grew up in the 80s. I can't stand party conflicts. Yeah. <laughs> if, if people want to play a game of party conflicts and they set out and do it consensually and, and whatever, so ridiculous. I, fun for I, some will, I will not yuck on somebody's yum, yep. yeah. but so much of my childhood of 80s gaming was um, uh, teenagers with little impulse control and no emotional uh, understanding yelling at each other because their characters did something yeah. to each other, often dickish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Way more prefer yeah. party harmony over yeah. PvP. Yes. I, I, w I was lucky enough to be asked to join a campaign that was already in progress when a player dropped out. And they brought me in, and I'm, this was a Pathfinder game. And one of the players was a, was a venerable wizard, elven wizard. And I came in as a, as a half elf witch. And they're like, so how are you guys in the party? And the other player looked right at me and said, oh, he's my illegitimate son. And I'm like... Yes. Okay. That's it. We we. That's it. There was okay. and, and 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 you just found out who I am, and I don't like having an illegitimate son. I'm like, we're good, and that was it. That solved. It was a little thing. Sure. But there was no question from that point on. He threw something out. I had to grab onto it, and I had no reason not to. But you play along with that, and now we had a party, and there was no question as to why we were still together as a group. Right. Um, By the way, the cleric of good and the assassin of Orcus. Yeah. Brothers. Yeah. That's good. Like, oh, yeah. why haven't you killed each other? Your brothers. Like, I, I would have an interesting time, but you know what? Me and Tony. <laughs> Which one? Me and Tony could play those two characters. Oh, oh my God, yes. <laughs> yes. We could play those two characters. Yes, and it would be interesting. that'd be hilarious. But it's that whole, it's the whole blank slate mm -hmm. versus here are some, some, even a small number of constraints. Well, Just and that, say, go make a party versus, you know, go make a party of people that are adventuring for this reason. Yep. Or or just or just have to be or just have together. To, to, like to that's a boundary. Along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, this is why I don't like big backstories. I like very very basic backstories. Build it at the table. You know. Leave some gaps that you can then go. Oh, I'm going to use that to, to attach something over here. Yeah, yeah. And make a hook to you and make a hook to that arc. I I, I can't remember what GM told me. They and I use this now. They said, uh, if a player wants to come with a pre-generated backstory, I tell them. They can have three paragraphs, no paragraph can be more than three sentences. After sentence nine, I'm not reading anything else. You can have it for your own character, but none of it's going to be canon until it comes, out, comes up in the game. And, uh, and that, that makes sense, because it, it makes it easier to build, the, to build the game from that point on and build ties with characters. So at some point, we should, um, Bob, if you wouldn't, oh, you can't pin it. I got uh, it. Jerry's going to pin it. We should do a whole. We should do a, a thing on backstories. We should. I have some. I have some feelings about backstories in 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 two in feelings. two different directions. Yeah. Yep. Like yep. I have conflicting feelings about backstories, and I am, um, I am happy to put um, the contradictory feelings about them on the table. So mm -hmm. we will we will down the road to do a backstory um, episode because I think it's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, yeah, I, um, what was I going to say? No, I'll leave it at that. Let's, let's, um. You want to jump back in? Uh, yeah, I'm just taking a look really quick. Um, yep, and just talking about a, uh, ETU game, um, which is actually one of my favorite Savage World settings, yep. East Texas University. You don't punch people in the face in that game. Yeah, no, you got to make it sure, you got to make sure you pass your classes. Yes, that's true. That's, and, you know, don't get eaten by the, like, horrible monster. Yeah. All right, um, cool. Uh, take us back in, Jer. All right, so. Uh, we're welcome back. We're gonna now go to our roundtable discussion, and we're gonna take our boundaries and start with a couple questions. And our first question is: Name a time when you failed to establish a boundary in a game, and it wrecked things, uh, in the short term or bad enough to tank the whole campaign. <laughs> so we'll go with Bob. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will start out, and uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. I've tweaked things a little bit, but let me know. Um, so. Uh, we've talked about this campaign a couple of times during the course of my time on this show. I ran a Palladium Fantasy campaign way back in the day that Phil was in. In the day, like in the 90s back day. Back in the day, in the 90s. And uh, one of the mistakes that I made <laughs> was that uh, I pulled in all kinds of wacky stuff from all kinds of sources. From the internet. From the internet, including untested fan-made things oh. like classes and spells. And I gave Phil's wizard a lovely gem called Increase Weight. Oh. And that spell, you could cast it on any object with no saving throw uh -huh. and change the weight. You could go up or down. Mm -hmm. uh, change the weight of that item. Uh, it, so It went up by level. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> he would go like, oh, there's an enemy spellcaster over there wearing robes. Uh, your robes are now too heavy and they push you to the ground. Yeah. And then I walk over and slit their throat. Um, <laughs> Heinously overpowered. <laughs> it was Wait, like it, 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 it was ridiculous. You you should have imposed in, in retrospect, yeah. you should have either one taken it away from me, or two, when an object was on a living person, let them the make the saving throw. Save. Yeah, exactly. yeah. In retrospect, it was a very I I I I was bad player. Oh, you like, abused the hell out of I it. abused I the shit away. out of that power. No. That wasn't the only mistake I made in that game. No, but that's another. Story. No, that was a that <laughs> and, and as and as a player, I was very bad because it, I found an exploitable loop in the game uh -huh. and was like, I, I didn't use it all the time, but like uh, when I needed it, I like oh this guy this guy pulls back his sword to swing at you eight hundred pound sword, <laughs> guy falls over yep. slit his throat <laughs> like it just it was bad. Bad. What about you, Jerry? Oh, I ran a long GURPS fantasy campaign in the 90s, and we ended up getting a player that came in, and we had a player who just decided to violate the setting boundaries. It was this was high fantasy, you know, sword and sorcery, magic, knights, wizards, goblins, orcs, the whole thing, and this player just wanted to keep implementing real world physics into the game. Um, we had science and physics, and he. Did things like trying to invent his own cart-mounted flamethrower by putting together a press and a bunch of things, um, all sorts of just. Is this like the guy who like had the the arrow with the portable hole? And... He would have come up with that if that was a, if that <laughs> right, was the okay. case. But he was using like real-world physics and all yeah. sorts of things. Not to mention the fact it was a character with a um, intelligence of seven. So <laughs> his character couldn't have actually figured out how to do this. But it got to the point where I allowed the first few because I was still a fledgling GM with new players uh, with a new system. And, uh, well, it wasn't that new, but it just got to the point where it just wrecked the campaign, where I just decided one day, like, I'm not having fun with this game. We're going to play something else. And it was all because this character just kept making things difficult for everybody and trying to dominate. And yeah. he wasn't playing within the settings of the game. So how about you, Phil? So I um, the one that comes to mind is um, there's a game uh, by Eden Press um, called Witchcraft. Mm -hmm. um, which I was rather fond of, and I ran it for, I ran it back in the 90s for a group that Bob was in, which I really liked, I had a really good experience with it, and so um, I, like, years later, was going to run it again. And I was like, cool, um, like, let's make characters. Now, the actual Witchcraft game only has, like, five character classes. They're, they're pretty mm -hmm. honed in. Um, and, and I was, you know, like, everybody in the group, except for one person, was like, the character classes in the core book are great. And this one person was like, ah, oh, none of these are really doing it for me. There's a supplement for the game. Can I play the vampire? And I'm like, well, I'm like, 
I don't know. It's a supplement from the from the publisher. Like, it must be safe. Um, so, what, I like, what could possibly go wrong? Right. What could possibly go wrong? So, I was like, all right, cool. Like, I looked at I looked it over, and I was like, cool. Yeah, you can totally play this thing. Now, when I say vampire, it's not a blood sucker. It's an essence sucker. And essence is like the fuel of this game. Anyway, long and short of it is. Um, yeah, now your mic's super hot. Like, something clicked when you put it down. So just put your... There you go. Um, so now, um, I, I kick the game off. And three of the five... Or four of the five characters totally work. Like, great concepts. All of that. Totally workable. And then, the vampire. And it totally doesn't work. And ultimately... I, I killed the campaign. Like, I just couldn't, I, I, um, I couldn't work around it. I tried a few, I tried a few sessions of like trying to change things up or give them like different challenges. But like that character class totally did not work with the other character classes and just broke the game. And uh, sucked because the rest of the, like it had a cool storyline. I really liked the, um, like one of the players who normally makes like super power like characters made this like non-powered character that was a writer um and he was like a history he was a history writer that talked to ghosts that's how he wrote history mm -hmm. it was oh it was so good it was like so role play and like, i would go back and play witchcraft again anytime you want oh i like i really like that game <clears throat> i would love to try that that's witchcraft? One that, it's one of the ones that never got a chance to play. And I have an was Excel good. spreadsheet character creator for it so. <laughs> oh <laughs> look well. at that i think i think the thing is a lot of those it also depends on the player because you can sometimes be in games where um, one player out of six isn't fitting or one player out of four isn't fitting. Yeah. And if you get a good player, they're just going to say, you know what, I don't think this is fitting. You know, I'm going to drop this character out and start with something new. And they don't, they don't want the whole campaign to tank because of them. And with a good player, they'll often do that because um, they don't want to see the game end either. Yeah. And, I, and you know, like, I, I mean, I've had many cases where... Um, I, I I had one player in particular who um, always had trouble <coughs> making their character without having played the game a bunch. Mm -hmm. So I would always, I had a standing rule, and it wasn't just for that character, it was for everyone. Like, up until session three, if you need to fix something on your sheet, like, fix it. Like, change a skill, mm -hmm. swap out a trait, whatever. Like, this feat's not working the way I thought it would, I'm going to dump like, it for another just one. Just switch it. I, I want everyone to be happy. Mm -hmm. So... If you if you looked at it in the book and you put it down on paper and it didn't work the way you thought it was gonna work, like no worries, like swap it out and let's just keep going. Um, yeah, so I think the theme is, so I think the theme is from listening to these, right? In every case, um, like someone broke a boundary and rather than immediately clamping down on it, we all just tried to yep. let it ride mm -hmm. and if there's if there's a good takeaway from tonight's um, discussion, if you're especially if you're a newer GM, just let it ride when it comes to a boundary issue. Never works. Nope. It doesn't get better. It doesn't fix itself. And yeah. even if this case goes away, mm -hmm. it'll just come up again somewhere else. Yep. If your first thought is how bad could it get, if, stop right, <laughs> right there. <laughs> it's probably bad. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably the best takeaway from this question is that um, in every case, we all try to appease a player because we didn't want the player to be mad and we wanted the player to be engaged with the game. But ultimately, in our attempt to do that, we actually damaged the game. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, looking back, if I had held the line way back at session zero and just said, nope, we're not doing any supplements, I need you to just make a character from this book. Yep. That person probably would have made a oh, that that prob, that character that person would have made a perfectly fine character, mm -hmm. and that game probably would have continued. Um, yeah, like I just I think that's like I think that's like the best takeaway we can. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right, next question. Question two: Describe your current session zero technique. Um, do you establish all or just some of the boundaries we've talked about? Like, do you do all of them? Do you do some of them, etc.? Jerry. Um, I normally start by just discussing what the setting is. What are we doing? What, where are we? What's the, the plan of the game? And follow with the theme and tone. This is the plot. This is where I want to go with it. This is how I want it to feel. 
Um, so that's you know, basically cats. Like, yeah. You're doing cats without the yeah. acronym. And, yeah. and, and But discuss with the players. This is what I had in mind. And if everybody else says, well, I thought about this or I don't like this, we, we can adjust it. Um, then we discuss what kind of characters they want to be and we discuss it together as a group mm -hmm. so we don't get too much overlap of, of skill type and so people get an idea of what they want to do. Um, then we discuss any house rules that do exist so that everybody gets to know what they are. And lastly, we discuss any house rules that have to come in based on character concept because mm -hmm. somebody decides, I've got a great idea of what would fit in this game, but I don't know how to do it with this. Okay, let's design your character and let's all talk as a group. What do we think would be a good way to simulate this in the game is it is it just uh is it a new rule or is it just reskinning or is it something we have to adjust um something up or down um uh, we had a savage worlds game with a character wanted to play a werewolf and um wanted to have a whole bunch of abilities with his blood and i told him okay i'm going to take a bunch of edges that already exist we're just going to reskin them and some of them will be available to you at a lower um rank level because mm -hmm. you're taking these other disadvantages to oh, compensate for nice. that and the rest of the party's like yeah that sounds good but we put that all into place but we wrote it all down yeah, so yeah. it was there in place so the player knew how to build his character and the party knew what they could expect and nobody felt left out in the cold by it uh, yeah that's really good right? yeah. how about you phil so i've gotten better at this um mm -hmm. i think in the past <laughs> in the past this was kind of haphazard like i actually didn't um like i didn't actually take notes for my session zero i would just kind of show up and be like cool we're gonna play this and I would do a lot. Of, I would do like a lot of the things you just said, but I would just do them. Um, the last couple campaigns I have done, I have actually made um, a session zero prep, which oh. actually has like cats, and I actually like fill out a table that's like this is what this game's about, and then safety and like I like I, I play with the same group of people, um, so our safety stuff is <clears throat> is almost understood, but it doesn't hurt to. We always um, discuss it. Quick check, yep. right? Like, there's a couple standard ones that are always in there, right? There's there's a line on ch on violence against children. There's a veil on sex. Those are my two. Yep. I add yep. them to... I, I drop them into every... Most I drop. I basically agree. drop those into every game I run. Yep. Um, I mm -hmm. have no need to get graphic on sex in a game. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of other things to have violence against. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, we can build off that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but now I do that, like, I am actually much more purposeful about that. I was not in the past, and I've really started to, um, to do a, a better job of actually laying that out. Honestly, your, any session zero, especially for boundaries and those kind of things, boundaries and safety and everything, mm -hmm. any session zero should be a living document. It should all be written down, codified, mm -hmm. so that A, you've got it for reference, and B, you can review it later mm -hmm. to make sure... You don't have to make any adjustments or there have been deviations that you didn't catch that you're like, hmm, do we really want to do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, like you said, uh, we haven't actually reviewed what our what our boundaries were for Forbidden Lands nope. 16 sessions later. And it's <laughs> like, if you don't have them written down, then how do we know yep. what they are? Right. I so, mean, yeah. we're, we're clearly okay in that like we haven't had a safety violation exactly. and everybody's happy and everything else. But also, like, I'm pretty sure we're doing the thing yeah. we wanted to do, <laughs> but it would be worth checking. Um, but yeah, I, I do like, um, like, like I said, like I, this week I'm getting ready for our Headspace game, and I will actually make, in, my, in OneNote, I will make uh, a page called Session Zero, and I will lay it out, and actually, like, I will, it, it comes off, that session comes off like I'm running a meeting, mm -hmm. uh -huh. but, it's, but it's useful. Like, yeah. It's useful to actually go through all the motions of it rather than, cool, let's make some characters and play. Yeah. But you have to run it like a meeting a little bit. It's, it's too easy to get, um, go a figure, to get segued off. Oh, <laughs> sure. Um, yep. and, and then forget to do things or not have things written down. Yep. Um, where if you actually write them down and, and spell what you're going to do with rules, it makes a difference. Yep. Um, yeah. It's, it's worth, I, I now think it's worth doing in a structured manner. Um, only because, again, I get sidetracked and then I forget something. Like we didn't, like maybe we didn't do lines and veils or something. Bob, your mic's down again. Of course. They said it seems to work when it's not on your body. No, oh. and uh, I don't know if it's positioning or if it's the wire. No, there's something on the wire. All right. Anyway, um, uh, what you call? It? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's. I think the. Um, I kind of think that's like my big thing about it is, be more structured. How about you? How about you, uh, Bob? 
Yeah, so um, I haven't GM'd in a super long time. So I have actually, to the best of my knowledge, never run an actual official Session Zero. We've had, you know, discussions about what we wanted to do and stuff like that, but it's been a long time. So I will, if I ever do any, any GMing again in the future, which someday I will, I will definitely be having a Session Zero with a discussion of boundaries, probably cats, all of that stuff. I've learned a ton of stuff from a lot of different areas. Um, so one day, but right now... Yeah, I mean, your long. your last GMing predates safety tools. Oh, yeah. Like, there, there was no X card when... Nope. Yeah. There was, like, cut it out, don't be a dick. Yeah. And, and I, I don't mean that jokingly. I, no, mean, I mean, I mean, I mean it partially to be funny, but, like, literally there were no safety tools. Yeah. Like, we, you know, either yelled at each other or got pissed off or somebody left the game early. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. there were a lot of that, um, what you call it? There was a lot of that shit going on. Cool. And, Ange made the comment that the trick is finding the balance between letting the players have the characters they enjoy, but also making sure that those characters will still work in the campaign. Yeah. Yes, and, and so the pressure of, well, I want you to have fun, so play whatever, you know, um, game-wrecking character you want mm -hmm. um, is not worth losing the game over. Correct. So, um, yes. All right. Yeah. Question three. Yeah, hit us up with that last question. In one-shot games, how do you establish boundaries? What are your must-establish things, and what things can you relax, if any? This is the panda question, right? Because we talked about we've been talking about campaigns, and so yes. now we just talked about one-shots. Mm -hmm. Who writes these sessions? Who writes these episodes? Um, but no, it is valid because everything that we've talked about so far has been very campaign-oriented. But you still, especially if you're running a one-shot like at a convention. Like, you still need to set some boundaries, and in some cases more so, uh -huh. because you may not know anyone you're sitting at the table with. Right? Like, yeah, absolutely. you mm -hmm. may not know anyone here. Um, Personally, yeah. as a player, and if I ever GM day one shot, which is probably what I'm going to GM the next time I do GM, it's probably going to be a one shot just to get my feet wet again. But the, my big one must do is the tone. Uh -huh. Tone is huge, because that basically... It, that that filters down into so many other things, so I would make sure tone is established and, and clarified for everyone, so that we know where we are. When I when I do a one shot, I like to set the tone and tell them about the theme real quick, even if we got pre gens, and discuss what lines we have. But as a player, I like to ask the general theme what the genre is, just because the GM tells us what they're running, or if it's in a convention book, you still want to know what what's actually going on. I mean, if you're doing like a spy game, you need to know, are we doing uh, an espionage game, a heist game, a political thriller, a hunt and kill? Yeah, um, I mean, is this, yeah, all is of this, that is this, under is, spy. Right, is this James Bond or Tinker, Taylor, Soldier, Spy? Exactly. Like, that's a huge difference. And we've seen that in games I've played where the players are all trying to play it one way and they end up losing the game, so to speak, because they don't get anywhere because they've been trying to play it one way and the GM intended for them to do something totally different. Yep. So... All right. I think, um, so when I, when I do one shots, because I do them a lot, um, I do have, um, I, I, like, I don't do a formal cats, but I basically get all the pieces of cats into the opening. Um, and uh, I'm not shy, because we're under a time crunch, I'm not shy about saying, like, setting a few hard boundaries. Like, like when I run Hydro Hackers, like, I just say outright, like, you are a team, you all work together. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. that is there's there's no space for maybe I'm secretly a traitor for the water authority. Mm -hmm. Like no. not happening at this table. Nope. Right? So I like I put a few of those things down hard. Like not in a mean way, but mm -hmm. very definitive. Like you guys are all a team and you do a thing. Mm -hmm. Like like that's that's not negotiable. That's just a thing we're talking about. Um I will do I always I, I do safety. So mm -hmm. I have, I, in my, in my one shot notes, like, I, cause I prep, like, you know, like I write my notes for the con season for whatever game I'm running. Mm -hmm. And in my intro part, I always have a safety check. So we do lines and veils and, um, uh, which we do lines and veils and we do a little bit of content warning. So like one of the things I always tell people when we're playing Hydra hackers is I'm like, look, this is a game about oppression, uh, and scarcity and poverty. Like, like you, like you pretty much need to just be comfortable with those. If you're not, like this may not be the best game for you, mm -hmm. right? Um, but those are things that are absolutely in the game, yeah. right? Um, so I try to put those down 
um, quickly. I don't want to rush through them, but I get them out early mm -hmm. uh, because I want the rest of the game to flow off of those things. Like, you're a team. This is a game about oppression. Like, one of the things I often have to say is, like, you can't beat the water authority. Like, you can't beat them outright. You can get small victories. Yeah. You can win this day, whatever. But, like, your chance of beating the water authority is pretty nil. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so I just, like, I get those out there really quick. Um, and I try to do some of it, especially with tone and stuff, um, in a more colorful way. Like, one of the ways, like, and I always describe, if you've all played, you, I know you have all played, when I describe the water authority, I always say it's the worst parts of a um, government agency, a cable company, and a software company. Mm -hmm. Right? Th this helps, like, set tone. Right? Like, these are my tone-setting things. Um, the other thing I do, because we got, a, like, a little bit of a hustle, is... Um, I have some illustrations from the game uh -huh. and I put them on the table. Like I have the water authority pictures, right? Cause those help set tone, right? The, you know, they're the, um, the water authority enforcement officer is a scary looking picture. Uh -huh. And I'm like, this is what you're up against. Put it on the table. Heavily armed and armored dude really says a lot. Uh -huh. Yes. And I've even said to people like your best bet is run. Uh -huh. Like, uh, and then the other thing I do is during the game, um, and I balance this carefully. Sometimes I will tell people like, oh, actually in this setting, here's the thing you know, yeah. right? Like, you know that no one would be up in this neighborhood selling water, right? Right. I just like put those out there um, in the middle of the game for people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't do that if like the flow of the game's going really well. I, I, don't, I don't make people play like super orthodox to my setting. Mm -hmm. I have my own head cannon for Hydra Hackers. Mm -hmm. I know other people have their own version of it. Mm -hmm. So if a game is going and it's flowing well and it's a little off from tone from mine, mm -hmm. I will actually let it stray a little. Yeah. Um, if it's gonna go wildly off tone, like I think Tony wanted to like sell water for money or something. I was like, no, <laughs> like no, no, that is not a thing that happens in this game. We don't do that here, Tony. No, and, and Why Tony, does that not well, Tony knew it was like his second or third time yeah. playing, so he's like, cool, I'm gonna go push some boundaries. And I was like, nope, these boundaries push back. Yep. Yeah. Like, um, so I, I, I do think, I, I guess the point is, in a one shot, uh, because you don't have a lot of time, mm -hmm. you need to, you need to convey a bunch of this stuff, but you can't take two to three hours to do it. You, you need like 30 minutes to compact mm -hmm. um, all of this in place. And sometimes you have to do a little adjustments on the fly. Yep. I think that's kind of what I was getting at. I think that's what you were getting at as well. And I've done the same thing you have. As a player, like I have looked at a GM and been like, hey, is this game like super serious, a little serious? Like just so that I know where to put my character. Like sometimes I just want to know like, um, if I'm a little funny, is that going to be off, right? Like if my if if my character has like is a practical joker, is that going to screw things up? You know, like I, I sometimes ask those questions because it is that tone thing that Bob said. Like mm -hmm. I want to make sure I'm in tone with your game, mm -hmm. and if I did like if you didn't get it to me clearly, then I will as a player like ask to make sure like is this cool? Yeah, I mean because you have like sci-fi action game. There's a huge difference if somebody says you know you're a bunch of smugglers. There's a difference between are we Firefly or are we Star Wars? Yeah. Those are two very different kinds yeah. of smugglers, and people coming with the wrong idea are going to come into it with a different mm -hmm. uh, feeling of just how good they are and what they're doing. Mm. You actually, you know, that's before oh. that. That's one more thing I forgot. So I should ask, what is our power level compared to what's going on in the game? Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good. Sure, one. sure. Because there's nothing worse than going into a game and thinking this happened in Torg. Walking into a game and thinking, oh, we're going to play Torg. We're these super power, sorry, super powerful guys and walking in and realize, oh my God, that kid with a stick almost killed half the party. Um, <laughs> you know, right. that, that's something you need to know. Yeah. And as a GM, you should let the party know this. Um, if you've got a fantasy campaign going and the GM's thinking everybody's going to be like the Witcher, it's going to be grim, and, yeah. and then everybody else is making those characters and I roll in with Jaskier the Bard, which sometimes works. Sometimes works. Right. Because it worked in The Witcher. Yes. But if that's not what, what everybody else was looking for, yes. I'm all of a sudden the odd man out and, and I'm screwing with the tone. So one of the things, especially in a one shot, one of the, the ways that you can quickly convey tone is actually what Jerry just did, which is make media references. Yep. So if I say to you, hey, um, 
you guys, like we're playing, let's say we're playing um, Scum and Villainy. Mm -hmm. So we're playing Scum and Villainy, you guys are gonna be smugglers, and um, you know, it, this is a very Firefly-esque kind of game. Right like, there, I know exactly what you're looking yeah. for. Yeah, now, some people may not get it because they're not familiar with the thing, and you can help them with that. Go a little deeper, give them but a little more. a lot of times, if you throw that pop culture reference in, especially for one-shots, mm -hmm. um, even better, if you've written it into your description for the game, yep. Yep. right, a Firefly-esque, you know, set yep. of smugglers, <clears throat> like, you can convey a lot yeah, with, those, um, with those tropes. Yep. If you're in the Serenity and four Imperial fighters show up, you're in trouble. If you're on the Falcon and Florida Imperial Fighters show up, everybody's starting to whistle at the, the right. song in their head. Right. So it's a different feel. Very much I so. I like that. Yeah. All right. Yeah, um, that's good stuff. I think that covers uh, our questions. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to head over to the conversation corner? Uh, is there anything in the chat room? Nothing that we haven't hit on so far. I like that, uh, what you call it, I'm getting, I'm getting get, um, private lessons on how to uh, GM my uh, Headspace game. Oh, nice. From Jason Pitt. Jason's like, oh, there's some stuff you should know. Awesome. I'm like, okay, good to know, because I'm going to get ready to run this game. I believe his quote is, mince my tender meat. Okay, well. Well, we've gone there. <laughs> well, now. Okay, then. <laughs> well, well, all right. All right. Very good. Are we not doing phrasing? <laughs> I, I, think, I, I, think we might, I think we might be doing phrasing. <laughs> all right, cool. Um, so, yeah, wrapping it up, that's our discussion about boundaries. Um, hopefully, uh, there's been a couple good takeaways. If you are a... Um, <coughs> If you are a new GM, hopefully this is a thing that you will um, take to heart. And if you're a seasoned GM, uh, hopefully you're doing better than me and kind of like checking in on your Session Zero stuff, because I'm definitely not. Um, and I'm going to have to get better at that going forward. You never stop learning as a GM. Uh, you never stop. There you no. go. Coolness, let's roll. Okay. Do you got a button? No. <laughs> Meanwhile... Okay, cool. Um, conversation quarter, where uh, now we talk about some other stuff. Um, Jer, you want to talk about some stuff? All right. Um, actually, for the last couple of weeks, it's been a lot of fun trimming down my RPG and board game collection. I'm not trying to get rid of tons of stuff. I've just been looking at the games that either I've never played, um, games that we looked at, read through once, said no, games are taking up space, or games that I have too many duplicates of. I have a lot of cooperative big box games. Uh, I've got Descent and Imperial Assault and Shadows of Brimstone and five of the Dungeons and Dragons games and Super Dungeon Explorer and Massive Darkness and I just said it's time to start getting some of those out that we're never going to play because we've got five or six we really like a lot. And so I've cleared some of those out. Um, I've got PDFs for all my Pathfinder stuff so I decided to get rid of a ton of Pathfinder rule books and I also got rid of uh, all of my Lamentations of the Flame Princess stuff because... Well, fuck Zach and fuck Jim, Jim Raggy, so sorry. <laughs> Just that's the way I feel. Um, and the place I was selling them to offered me like five times what I paid for this stuff. So, but, so I'll be buying more big box games probably. But <laughs> no, it's been nice to get shelf space up and get some games up and get stuff organized. Um, I live out of piles. It's the way my life has been. And as I slowly get older, I'm getting better and better at organizing and sorting and organizing and sorting. And it puts things together. Uh, the only problem is that when sorting stuff, you can fall into that trap of, oh, here's a game I haven't seen in a while. Uh, let me just open this up and take a look at this for a second. <laughs> I'm going to read a page, I'm going to read a chapter or two, and then close it up, um, you know, stop reading it, put it back on the shelf, <laughs> keep sorting. Um, narrator voice, he did not stop and put it back on the shelf. you got to set a timer sorting. for those kinds of yeah. things. <laughs> uh, that, that, that my sister-in-law bought me the year-by-year -year history of the Marvel Universe. They oh. brought it downstairs, opened it up, I actually put it downstairs, opened it up to put a bookmark in it. <laughs> Two hours later, my wife comes downstairs. What are you doing? I'm just standing there, pouring over the book. <laughs> Didn't even sit down, just standing there. Oh, uh, that's me. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> so, plus I was able to finally uh, get my finish my collection of the Fantasy Flight Star Wars game books because they're not making anymore. They're going to be scarce pretty quick. So, we're all set to go. So, uh, how about uh, you, Bob? So, um, in addition to um, getting a new laptop for the show, um, I got that on order. Um, I'm going to be taking out the uh, the fantastic oh. uh, work uh, technology loan. Literally the best. Where I will be paying the thing off through a payroll deduction, which is at awesome. Zero percent. Zero percent interest. So it is literally the best perk of your it job. It goes on my on my credit card for like you know less than the time it takes for the pay for you to finish. Yep. And then it gets paid off, and, and away oh, we go. So um, ridiculous. So that's fabulous. Um, 
I have been catching up on some TV stuff. I'm up to date on Picard, oh. which is, I think, an amazing show. I think they're doing such a great job. Um, I um, just caught up uh, because of my sinus infection. I was home the last two days, um, making sure that I, you know, recuperating pro pop properly. Almost had to do a word scramble there. And um, so I've been catching up on the CW superhero shows. Um, <clears throat> and getting ready to uh, to start binging something else, um, which I haven't decided what it's going to be yet. I, I keep getting told that I need to watch this thing and that thing and the other thing, and I'm like, ah, but Friday a show drops that I need to watch, and it's like, oh, there's just so many shows. So, um, mm -hmm. getting ready to do that. I still haven't done my taxes, which I told myself. Yeah, I haven't I done mine yet do. either. President's Day was the day I was supposed to sit down and do all of that, and then I didn't because I was sick. And then I was like, oh, one of these two days while I'm at home, I'll, I'll sit and nod. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I still got to figure out whether it's better for me to file separately or file with my wife this year. So That can be a mess. Just run I it through hated, TurboTax. I trying to figure that out. They should, Turbo, I just, I just ask my accountant. No, oh, you have an accountant. Never mind. I got TurboTax. You got to run, gotta run those things as, uh, what you call it, simulations or hey, something. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but uh, you know, just trying to recuperate and get back to being healthy again. Ten days of sinus infection sinus is not, infection fun. Is not no. fun. Although, the interesting thing was, I kept telling myself, oh, I should have gone in to the doctor earlier. And when I talked to the, the, the PA, actually, I didn't see the doctor, saw the physician assistant, she told me it's actually good that I waited ten days because, A, it gave my body time to try and fight it off. And now, having been in ten days with pretty much the same symptoms the whole time, a little variation in it, and then having explained all of that stuff to them, it gives them more information to go on to make their diagnosis. And she said, yes, you most assuredly probably have a sinus infection. We'll give you these antibiotics. And within a couple of days, you should start feeling better. If you would come in, you know, three days in, and it was really just a head cold, and you just didn't give your body enough time to work through it, then, you know, you're, you're jumping the gun. So that was interesting. Um, yeah, but yeah, I'm uh, I'm working my way back to healthy, and um, I felt bad because I'm like two weeks into my new job, and um, I had called my boss after I got the diagnosis of the sinus infection and, and got the antibiotics, and I called her up just to tell her I'm taking tomorrow off, which is today, to to make sure that the antibiotics get get their thing going, and then I'll be back ready to go on Wednesday, and then you can start throwing stuff at me because I'm ready to dive into the pool, but. Um, I haven't done a metric ton of stuff in the two weeks other than do some trainings. So yeah, in, the lar in the grand scope of things, that'll all work yeah, itself exactly. out. So looking forward to actually doing some work. So what about you, Phil? So um, I realized I think I'm getting close to the end of our uh, Minecraft season. Yep. Um, I haven't been logging in a lot. Um, I am super proud that my mech reactor is self-sufficient because... I'm not even there, and it's just running, like <laughs> night and day. Um, so I, I definitely did a nice job building it. But before we're done completely for the season, uh, I think I'm going to do it on Saturday, is um, I'm going to go uh, do some video capture of my screen and do a um, fly around mm -hmm. of the Tower of Mech. Like, I think it's probably the most impressive thing I've ever built in Minecraft. Uh, it's massive, right? It's, it's, it's one chunk Mm -hmm. um, in, in, it's one chunk in the center, and then it it it, it, it branches out to adjacent chunks. Um, but it's 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 an enormous structure. It's super complex, and I basically built everything that you could build uh, in that mod pack into it. Um, plus power, storage, all of that stuff. And it's organized with structure. Yeah, it has unlike like, the island of Tony. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> an example of two different minds. Yes. Yes. Um, but um, I, I feel like I'm almost done because I feel like I played out everything I wanted to in this season, uh, which was an excellent season. Don't oh, get yeah. me wrong. It was, it was an awesome season. It. I had a lot of fun. I, and I'm starting to contemplate, like, what should we take out of this pack? What should we add into it to, like, get ready for, like, season five? But in the meantime, I've started to play some other mod packs. So I played Absolute Mech from 47 Mark, uh, 47 Mark IV. Yeah. I did not like that pack. <laughs> App pack was so stressful. Mm -hmm. I think people who were on, who were with me on Mumble, all they heard for like two nights was me like, "Fuck, fuck, fuck." Yeah. Like I died. 
it, the game was super hard to get resources. Like, I really didn't have a good time. And eventually on Sunday was like, I'm not playing this game anymore because Minecraft is supposed to be my way to relax and I'm not fucking relaxing. Nope. So I downloaded a much nicer mod called FTB Academy. Very nice to play. Not that it's super easy, but it's more, it's more straight Minecraft with just a bunch of mods in it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's got this quest book. So like when you don't know what to do, you like look at the quest book and it's like, cool, make this thing. And then you get rewarded, like make this thing and you get like- Something else. Like for instance, it was like make all the tinkerers, um, uh, the, you know, the tool station and all that. Mm -hmm. And then it gave you like 32 uh, stencils. Yeah. So like you make a thing and then it gives you like material to use the thing. That's cool. So, and it does it for a whole bunch of mods and a couple of them that I haven't played before, which is really what I'm in for. Um, for playing that pack. So it's got um, Batania, which I suck at. I just got to practice. Astral Sorcery, which I didn't do in our current mod pack, which mm -hmm. you guys did. Um, Industrial Foregoing and um, uh, Draconic. Um, Draconic Evolution. Draconic Evolution, which looks bonkers as shit. Draconic Evolution is interesting <laughs> because you have to go down to Bedrock yeah. and dig for Draconium. You have to so. kill Withers. That too. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's also... But like, to do anything, you've got to find Draconium yeah. first, and Draconium is, like, literally only found at Bedrock. Yeah. Level. So, uh. <laughs> so I'm, I'm digging, like, I, so I'm playing that for now, and, like, this is the normal pattern. Like, this is what yeah. happens with us on the, on the servers, that we all play intensely in the beginning, then we all kind of accomplish, like, our internal goals, and then we all start to kind of drop off, and then the season kind of comes to a close. Um, so I, I wanted, like, all, like I said, before we shut everything down formally... Uh, and we'll announce it and stuff because we're not going to yeah. pull the plug on people who are playing. Yeah, like yeah. T Kustic is on there. I don't want to. T Kustic, by the way, made like this cathedral that oh, is like. Gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. T Kustic's architecture is a whole other discussion. But anyway, um, one of the things we could do is Absolute Mech has a server pack and like we could play it cooperatively as a group and see if it's better than <laughs> playing it alone. But I don't know. Like, I have my doubts. But I have my yeah. doubts as well. It wasn't fun. I have um, I'm willing to, to have a discussion, but I, but, but, <laughs> I, but I have some ideas. Like there are a couple mod packs I want to swap in and out. Um, but I liked, um, I really liked this season a lot. I got a lot mm -hmm. out of it. It was a lot of fun. Um, but I do know, like I know this feeling because at first yeah. I was like, no, 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 I've just been super busy. And then I'm like, mm. like I go into play and I'm like, I don't know if I want to mess with astral sorcery. Like I, I really yeah. like my tech stuff and I did all my tech stuff. So yeah. I've got about 15 meters of wall left to build, and I'm done. There you go. So see, we're yeah. like, like maybe, maybe like end of March or something. Yep. We'll wrap the season. I, um, we'll all log back in for one final, um, yeah, one final game or something. We should go fight the Hydra. I think Savannah yeah. wanted to go fight the Hydra. I think that's a good because I, I have, I have. I think it'll last like all of 10 seconds. If probably. We go fight it. Because <laughs> I've, I've, I'm now in season my season two, and so far out of two seasons, I've never been to the end. And I've been to the Nether. Oh, see, we got it. I've been to the Nether once. No, we'll just start it next season. Okay. I've, been, I've been to the Nether once, and that was only to fight the Nether Dragon, and that was it. Oh yeah, well, that's that, not and even that the Nether. That's the end. That's, that's the, the end. end. Okay, so I've been to the end once. I've never, I've never been, been to the Nether. I've never been other than I've just been busy. The Nether basically the, world. the Nether basically sucks. Um, However, I did I did manage to explore what uh, forty thousand blocks north and <laughs> yeah. 20,000 blocks in either direction so I mapped out a huge part of the world. Yeah, like I'm saying like I mean every I think a lot like I mean a lot of people got a, like a, a ton of stuff out of it. Yeah. Like, I had Tux the penguin mm -hmm. who I think is lost now. Tux, I have to like 3.0. No, I have to no, we, they found him. Oh, that's right. He went through the portal. He's like in the tower <laughs> yes, of mech right yes, now. Yes. Yeah, I didn't actually lose him. I didn't realize like Tux can't so I have this teleporter and only players can go through the teleporter, so that like text never wandered off. But he kept trying to get on. But I it. right, but I built this I built this mech tele this portal that takes me right to the tower of mech from my base. That apparently mobs can move through. Yeah. And Tux went right through it. By the way, good note in the future, if we ever play mech again, that portal is open to mobs. <laughs> so yeah. some precautions will need to be taken. <laughs> yes. But yeah, so Tux um, all right, so actually I'm, I'm very happy. I've had this um, pet penguin that's been living in my base and he's been kind of like the mascot this season that Tux just kind of wanders around and checks on things while I'm working. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, well, that's cool because when I take the video, you'll see Tux in it then because I'm yeah. going to do an interior um, interior and exterior shot of the building. So anyway, um, that's the long and short of it saying that um, I have not been playing a ton of Minecraft and since I started this new mod pack, I've actually been excited to play again, which means I know that I went past my... Um, 
my interest curve. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and my interest curve is almost always at the point where um, resources no longer matter. Yeah. I, I like do like one or two last big things and then I'm like, I have conquered everything. <laughs> like, I can't. Like, I, I want for nothing. I have everything. Uh, it's time to move on. Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, I did that. Again, I've been watching a lot of Narcos. Um, been reading um, House of X, the Marvel comic series, the new one um, by Hickman. Super good. Super good. Hickman I, uh, has put out some really oh, good stuff over the years. I've said it before. I think I've said it on the show. Hickman did my favorite run of Fantastic Four ever. And uh, if this is how the X-Men are going to go, I'm super excited. Because um, there's a whole storyline about Maura McT- McTaggart that's like super interesting that I did not like. They they did some retrofitting mm-hmm. in a really cool way. Good. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, that's basically it. I'm, I'm getting crushed at work, which is why I'm playing so much Minecraft. <laughs> like that, that's a thing. Um, but that's just going to be a thing for a while. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, should we uh, should we get ready to mosey on out? Yep. Yeah, we should do some uh, patron shoutouts and then uh, hit the after show. Yes, please, please do. Uh, you want me to do them? I would love if you would do them. All right. So, thank you very much to the following patrons. Noah Bon, Glenn Seiler, one of our Sunday mm-hmm. uh, Sunday table game people. Uh, Austin Lemke, Drew Smith, Secret Weapon of the Show. Oh, I think you just went out again. Jeff Stevens, M.T. Black, Troy Pitchelman, uh, Jason Pinella, David Walker, Jason Pitt, who's in the chat room. Um, Joe Rasso, Padme's Lover, who's got more costumes than anyone I've ever seen, mm-hmm. if you follow Padme's Lover on uh, on Twitter. Uh, Donahue McCarthy, Robert Dorgan, uh, Boo Day, uh, John Just John, Gene Lorbert, Dan Simons, Matthew Petrozelli, and Ryan Bolter. Thank you, everyone, for listening today. If you are free on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. the Queen's time, come join us live on Twitch, where you can chat with the other listeners in the awesome chat room for life and ask us the occasional question. If you can't make it to the live show, check out our podcast each week, wherever you get your podcasts. Take a listen to some other shows in the Misdirector Mark Network, such as Down with D&D, Bonestone and Obsidian, Pandas Talking Games, The Gnome Cast, jean Gu Hustle, She's a Super Geek, Bonus Experience, and the FM Gamers AP. You can and should also check out our sibling podcasts, The Tabletop Bellhop, The Knights of the Night, and the always amazing Gaming MBS. After you have been running your campaign for a while, and just after you review your Session Zero, leave us some feedback. You can reach us directly... On the old-fashioned emails, mmp at misdirectedmark.com. Hit us up on Twitter. The show, The Network, is at misdirectedmark. This guy over here is Robert M. Everson. This guy is GM Gerrymander. And as always, I'm DNA Phil. If you like what we do here and on the other shows in the Misdirected Mark Network, you can support our Patreon campaign. MMP, down with D&D, and Pandas Talking Games are at patreon.com slash mmp. She's a super geek is at patreon.com slash sassgeek. Zhangu Hustle is at patreon.com slash Zhangu Hustle and bonus experience is at patreon.com slash bonus experience. Patrons of MMP, Down with D&D, and Pandas Talking Games get access to the after show, pre-production show notes, musical parodies, the Pandas Talking Games bonus outtakes, and other special releases. As well as the uh, Minecraft server. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. That's a thing. All right. This has been a Mystery to Mark production. The media arm of Encoding Designs. Mic drop. We out.